I'm speaking with Dr. Bradley Hart, author of Hitler's American Friends, the Third Reich's Supporters in the United States. Thank you for speaking with me. I'm glad to be here. So first, uh, tell me, how did you get into uh, studying and writing about uh, history, World War II history? Yeah, well, I've always been interested in history. I did my undergraduate degree at California State University, Fresno, where I'm now an assistant professor. Um, and I knew that I wanted to study sort of 20th century, Second World War era stuff. Uh, so I went off and did my PhD at the University of Cambridge in the UK after doing an MLIT at the University of St. Andrews, where, yes, I did play quite a bit of golf uh, in addition to my studies. Um, but I, um, I did my PhD dissertation on the 20th century eugenics movement, which was this movement that sort of inspired the Nazis to um, adopt some of their racial policies. What a lot of people don't realize about that is that eugenics actually originated in Britain and the United States. And my home state of California had one of the most active eugenic sterilization programs in the 1920s and 1930s. So that sort of whetted my appetite for looking at these sort of transnational connections between uh, political extremists, really, of all stripes. Um, and so as part of that, I ended up writing a biography of a man named George Pitt Rivers, who was a prominent British anthropologist and eugenicist, who later on became a Nazi sympathizer and was in prison during World War II. And coming out of that research, I sort of realized that there was a wider international story here. And so I started looking into far-right groups in the United States. And I should point out, this was around late 2014, early 2015, when I started working on this. And at that point, this project was seen by a lot of people that I had talked to about it as kind of outlandish, kind of an obscure part of history that no one really cared about. Uh, and that certainly changed as it got into late 2015 and early 2016. Uh, and I think certainly the interest in this topic has really skyrocketed in the past few months after after Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the book then. How do you, uh, what's the main theme and how do you uh, lay it out? I think the main thesis of this book is really that the Nazi threat to the United States was much greater than people have appreciated. And by the Nazi threat, I don't mean necessarily a military threat. Of course, Hitler never comes close to invading Britain, let alone the United States. But there were a number of, of quite dangerous and quite influential groups in the United States that wanted to push the U.S. into a closer relationship with Nazi Germany. And I think we have to be careful here because we're not saying that these groups wanted to ally outright with Nazi Germany, although some of them some of them would have preferred that. But really their, their more proximate and realistic political goal was keeping the U.S. from entering um, the Second World War at any point. And this is where we get involved with people like Charles Lindbergh, isolationist on Capitol Hill. Um, there's really a, a wide cast of characters and figures that appear in this book. Mm -hmm. Do you focus on um, individuals or do you focus on events or um, how do you, how does the book progress? Yeah, the, the book is arranged thematically. So across every chapter, I look at a different group or organization. I, I, there are no chapters that really focus on individuals. Um, so in the course of that, I talk about a group called the German American Boon, which was a group of uh, pro-Nazis, Nazi sympathizers um, nationwide. Uh, virtually every state outside the American South had a chapter of the boon. I talk about a group called the Silver Legion, which was run by a former Hollywood screenwriter uh, turned mystic, turned sort of Hitler emulator. Uh, that was another nationwide organization. And then I talk about sort of more abstract groups. So I talk about businessmen who did, did business quite successfully and profitably with the Third Reich, um, including major corporations like General Motors and Ford. Um, Coca-Cola also had a German division, and there are a few others that appear in there as well. And in that chapter, I also talk about one of the more dangerous uh, plots against the United States in this period, and that was a plan by a businessman named William Rhodes Davis, who was a sort of oil wildcatter who ended up doing business with the German Navy um, after some complicated uh, machinations that I talk about. But then in 1940, is kind of employed by the German embassy in Washington to try to defeat FDR in the 1940 election. Um, and they allocate apparently $5 million for this project. And so it's a well-funded, well-heeled effort. It, of course, goes nowhere. Roosevelt wins the election. Um, but it's sort of one of the more major plots. And then I sort of wrap up the book. There are a few other chapters in there about students who are uh, studying abroad in the Reich. But then I also talk about America First. America First was the most prominent isolationist in the intervention group in the country, and I look at the figure of Charles Lindbergh in there. So, considering the different ways that Germany, Nazi Germany, could have influenced the U.S. or affected the U.S., you know, you have, you know, open sympathizers, you have uh, a fifth column, say, developing a, a fifth column within the United States, um, yeah. spying activity, 
uh, sabotage? Ha- do, do you get into those various ways of influence, or is it more the overt kind of stuff? No, I absolutely do talk about that. Yeah, and this is a really um, timely discussion in some ways. There's a lot of discussion now about foreign countries trying to interfere in our political processes, and that certainly went on in the 1930s and early 1940s. Uh, the Germans were very adept at this, at planting stories in the press, trying to confuse American public opinion, and essentially convince the American people that the, that the British cause in the Second World War was doomed. Um, there is a chapter also on spies and espionage in there. Um, and one thing, one of the more intriguing discoveries I made in researching this book was that one of Hitler's key spy masters on the West Coast of the United States actually attempted to defect to the British at one point, and the British rejected his overtures. So um, numerous opportunities were lost to dismantle the German intelligence network, uh, and the Germans were quite successful in stealing secrets. Um, one of the ironies of the Second World War, though, is that most of the military secrets they stole were never really used. Um, certainly some of the information about ships sailing from the East Coast was used to torpedo their ships and to kill American sailors, but most of the technical secrets were never actually um, implemented or implemented too late in the war to really make a big difference. So while the Germans were fairly successful at stealing secrets, the value of the secrets they stole was, was really not that great as far as we know. So considering the um, very large percentage of German people of German heritage who lived in the United States at this time, how much di- did you get into any anti-Nazi, uh, German anti-Nazi activity within the U.S.? Was there conflict there within the communities that you found? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's something that I try to emphasize whenever I talk about the book. But the vast majority of German Americans, whether they were recent immigrants from Germany, and one thing we often forget is that there were many recent immigrants from Germany in this period because people had left Germany after the First World War and when the economy tanked through the hyperinflation um, issues in the early 1920s. The vast majority of these people were, were demonstrably loyal to the United States. Many of them ended up fighting in the Second World War quite honorably for the U.S., and so we're really talking about a fairly small cross section. Um, one of the more interesting um, chapters in that regard is the chapter that I have on students and universities. Um, universities became a real hotbed of conflict in this period between anti-Nazis of, of any stripe, um, also some pro-communists who certainly were on university campuses as well, and these sort of pro-Nazi elements. One of the stranger sort of phenomena in this period is that university administrators um, try to punish people. The, sort of the, the current level of academic freedom didn't really exist. That concept wasn't really in place in the 1930s. And so they end up punishing a lot of the anti-Nazi voices because the Nazis are seen as somehow more respectable. They're not as perceived as, as dangerous as communist agitators are. And so universities sort of end up creating a, um, a space in which Nazi-esque ideas are actually kind of begin to spread on American university campuses. So um, yeah, there's, there's a great deal of conflict, and that's something that we forget often because we tend to think of this period as sort of America moving towards inevitable intervention in the war. But there were levels of violence taking place in these places between pro-Nazis, pro-communists, anti-Nazis, just average Americans, in some ways resembled the late 1960s. Mm-hmm. How many uh, newspapers did... Um pro-Nazis have, where they were producing within the United States. Do you have any kind of numbers on that? No specific numbers, but there are a few big examples. Um, in this period, of course, newspapers are seen as the most respectable form of, of sort of mass communication, and so all of these organizations actually launch their own papers. So the German-American Bund has its own German language newspaper that its members receive. Um, one of the more interesting aspects of that, though, is a guy named Father Coglin, who is sort of written out of history books today, but was in some ways the most famous radio commentator maybe ever um, had a huge audience numbering in the millions well above what anyone uh, since has been able to assemble and he actually publishes a newspaper called Social Justice that he claimed had more than a million subscribers so certainly there were a lot of um, sort of vaguely pro-Nazi organs um, some of these were German language Social Justice was obviously English language which gave it a much larger audience um, and then you certainly have sort of normal newspapers, um, commercial newspapers across the country that take vaguely isolationist stances in this period, and they take, well, not vaguely, but explicitly anti-isolation, or or anti-intervention, I should say, stances, Um, and some of those do sort of border on expressing sympathies for Nazi Germany at various points. So that that is one thing we underestimate, I think, is how sort of legitimate these views were seen or presented to the American people by by media outlets. Did you come across before uh, 1930? 39, did you come across any 
support visits or official military visits by German officers uh, in in the U.S. Was that going on at all? Do you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the United States and Germany are not at war until 1941. And of course, when when the war does break out in 1939, traveling across the Atlantic becomes quite hazardous because the British um, are are bombing things, the Germans are are sinking ships, and so. It really gets shut down uh, largely in 1939, but yeah, there were certainly official delegations. Um, the arrival of, of new German ambassadors was widely covered in the press. The Germans go through a couple of ambassadors in this period. Um, they have consulates all over the country. At various points, the German-American boot actually hosts members of the Nazi party at some of its sort of rural summer camps. They host members of the Hitler Youth. Um, and meet American youth. So, yeah, there was a, there was a great deal of, of travel back and forth. There were Americans that, that traveled to Germany as well, and there was no there's no reason why that couldn't take place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I want to touch on um, religion. Uh, you, I think I forget if you mentioned it or if it's in the book description. Um, you know about some of the uh, religious support uh, for Nazi Nazism, German Nazism within the yeah. U.S. Yeah, um, certainly. There's an entire chapter in there entitled The Religious Right, and by that I'm talking about people who did support the Nazis out of at least ostensibly religious convictions or affiliations. The most prominent example in that chapter is Father Coughlin, who I mentioned a moment ago, who is a Catholic priest based out of um, Michigan, who begins making, um, starts out actually as a very pro-Roosevelt commentator and calling for dramatic action to, to bring the Great Depression to an end, and then turns against Roosevelt and, and sort of becomes... I guess you would call him a, a sort of vague Nazi sympathizer early on, and then it becomes more and more explicit. Um, Cogman's argument is that Nazism is a natural response to communism. That communism is the real threat. Nazism is there to combat it. And as a Christian, he claims this is in some way desirable because um, communism is an atheistic creed. And so Coughlin becomes this huge outsized figure in the American political landscape in this period. Um, and he has a number of emulators. One person I talk about is Gerald E. Winrod, who is a almost completely forgotten figure today, but in the 1930s, he was very well known. He was a Kansas minister who, again, became an emulator of Coughlin's, um, goes on the radio and begins making anti-Semitic screeds, but then takes this further and actually runs for the U.S. Senate in Kansas in 1938 on the GOP ticket. Um, and this is a period in which Kansas is increasingly becoming Republican, and everyone sort of knows the re- Republicans will take this seat in the election. And Winrod is actually uh, in the lead for a while. The National Republican Party eventually steps in, denounces him, and convinces um, another politician to step in and, and win the race. But had that not happened, it's very possible that Winrod would have entered the U.S. Senate and become one of Hitler's most important American friends on Capitol Hill. So mm-hmm. quite a scary moment in some ways. But similar to Coughlin, Winrod's argument is fundamentally religious. That Nazism is a way, is a bulwark against communism. It is a Christian creed. He goes much further than Coughlin in that regard and claims that Hitler is actually defending the church against communist aggression. So religion is a very powerful motivator in this period. The U.S. is a much more religious country than it is today uh, in the 1930s. People sort of turn to religion during the Great Depression. And these commentators are incredibly impactful because of that sort of religious undertone that they put on their ideas. So I want to touch on, um, I have a question about occultism. You know, I've read, you know, I guess there's disagreement as far as how much the occult was part of Nazi Germany uh, thinking. Um, Do you come across any, I guess you kind of mentioned this mystical guy in the U.S. Um, Can you touch on that briefly about this occult stuff and... Yeah, certainly. I mean, we, we know that Nazism does have this occult aspect. Most of that comes in through the SS. So the, um, the SS has a sort of obsession with ancient German folklore and ancient German religion in that sense. And so Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, insists that SS officers take take part in sort of occult rituals and things of that sort. Um, as you say, there's debate as to how influential that is. Certainly, Nazism does not see itself as a version of Christianity. It does not see itself as a Christian creed, which is certainly the irony in what we were just talking about. Um, mm-hmm. And it, and there is this sort of this emphasis on rediscovering ancient Germanism, if you will, um, as, as a method of creating a stronger German state. Um, in terms of the groups that I look at in this book, you don't see so much on the occult. The sort of strangest um, figure is the one that you just mentioned, which is William Dudley Pelley, 
founder of a group called the Silver Legion. Um, and he certainly does believe in the occult. He actually is a spiritualist, believes that he's receiving instructions directly from Jesus uh, to found this organization. And as a result, his followers have this sort of weird amalgamation of trendy 1920s and 1930s spiritualist views and what they consider to be traditional Christianity. So he's probably the closest that, that this book gets to talking about the occult. Okay. Um, and I don't think you mentioned yet, as far as uh, U.S. military officers, was there, did you come across instances where, uh, you know, outside of the military structure where officers might have uh, been supportive of Nazism? Yeah, we certainly see it among some retired military officers. Um, there's a guy named Van Horn Mosley, who I actually don't talk about in the book, but he's a former U.S. general um, who is retired at that point and becomes a, a sort of figure around which the far right rallies. He dies in the 1930s, though, so too early to really become a major figure in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, military officers do feature in, though, in terms of espionage as well. Certainly, people who are working for defense contractors in the military occasionally do hand over secrets to uh, to, to German spies deliberately. Um, and again, as I said earlier, there's not a huge amount of evidence that those secrets turn the course of the war or, any, or even individual battles in that sense. But certainly, Allied lives were lost as a result of the sort of infections. Mm -hmm. So before I uh, ask you about the resources you used, are there any other um, secondary issues you wanted to mention that we haven't touched on yet that are discussed in the book? Sure, yeah. I think, I think one of the key things I talk about in the book is the role of America's political parties in all of this. One of the things that really impressed me as I was doing the research is that um, one reason why these uh, forces are not more successful is because the American political system is, is fairly resistant to them in this period. Uh, as I mentioned with Gerald Winrod, the national GOP steps in and prevents this guy, who's pretty much an open Nazi sympathizer, from winning the GOP nomination and Senate seat for um, in, in the state of Kansas. Uh, and so, and, and similarly, the Democrats, incidentally, um, when the extent of isolationism within the party becomes clear, end up voting a lot of those figures out of office in, in primaries, or they end up not even being renominated for their seats. And so, the discipline that American political parties show in this period is quite impressive, and I think that has some potential lessons for today. Mm -hmm. So as far as um, resources, what uh, what did you use? What did you collect to uh, do your research? Yeah, the bibliography on this thing is quite extensive. Um, I did research here in the U.S. Um, one of the big archives was the Hoover Institution, which is a fantastic resource up on the Stanford University campus. And that's where I found, um, most notably, the surveillance diaries associated with the German-American boom. So the boom was under investigation by various law enforcement agencies and, and by the press as well. I actually discovered a um, set of journal entries from a Chicago reporter who infiltrated them and uh, managed to actually become a leader in the organization. And he kept very extensive notes. So that was a really important find. Um, some other interesting resources I actually found in the UK. So this is kind of odd because this is a book that's fundamentally about the United States. But as it turns out, the British government had quite an extensive surveillance network in the United States in this period, partially because we were not yet allies, we had not entered the war, and Britain treated us as an intelligence target rather than an intelligence partner. Hmm. And so they actually had an extensive network of agents on Capitol Hill who were reporting back to London as to what they were hearing and what was going on, and those agents actually um, made great efforts to bust up a couple of Nazi plots that otherwise might have been more successful. And so the uh, and the National Archives in London were quite helpful in this project in um, in sort of finding those documents. And these are things that have only been declassified in the past five years or so. Hmm. Interesting. So did you, uh, are there any other interesting archival location, uh, locations where you found archives that uh, um, contain some interesting information you didn't expect? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was all over for this. Um, I went out to Kansas at various points to view the Gerald Winrod papers. I ended up um, viewing the pa pa papers of um, several individuals in small um, Mennonite universities in Kansas, so that was kind of an adventure. Um, I ended up in Edinburgh in Scotland viewing the papers of the British ambassador to the United States at this point, which had been sort of dramatically under-examined by other historians. There is There are a couple of books that use those papers, but those are just really an incredible resource. So... I was very lucky, and one thing that surprised me in the course of writing this book was that no one else had really done this before. No one had tracked down these different leads. No one had really looked at these resources. And one of one of my goals was to try to tell this story using a minimum of official documents, because FBI surveillance reports and FBI files can only tell you so much. They tell you what the 
investigators were thinking, but they don't really tell you what was going on within these groups themselves. So whenever possible, I tried to track down the originals, tried to track down the people that had actually created these documents, the people that had actually been in these groups, and tried to tell the story in some ways from that perspective. Did you come across any um, archives of oral histories that uh, assisted you in your research? Yeah, I use some oral histories. I and mean, oral history is a dangerous tool sometimes for historians because, of course, the oral histories can be somewhat unreliable. Um, I did I did use that in some cases. Um, the chapter on the Silver Legion, I think I used oral history to talk about how um, people in Seattle actually viewed the Silver Legion because that was one of its strongholds. So, yes, oral history is quite interesting. One thing that I, I did uh, that did surprise me in the course of this was that despite the number of Americans that were involved with these groups, not a lot of them seem to have talked about it after the war. Hmm. And you can sort of understand why. This was kind of a, you know seen as disreputable later on, but there were a huge amount of, of things available to people who had been German-American Boone members, for instance, or Silver Legion members. And yet these people must have been around. It's possible that some of them are still around today, actually. Mm-hmm. Did you find any um, primary document or any any artifacts or objects like diaries or something that were particularly striking to you in any of these locations? Yeah, as I mentioned, I think the the surveillance diaries I found at the Hoover Institution were really interesting. Um, and you sort of imagine these are sort of scrawled out on little sheets of paper, sometimes on hotel stationery. So you can imagine this guy crisscrossing the country and um, you know meeting with these German American boon members, some of whom are quite frightening by his accounts and sort of scrawling out these notes in the hotel secretly at the end of the day type thing. So that was one of those finds where you, you certainly, as a historian, begin to imagine the circumstances under which this document had been created mm-hmm. and sort of put yourself in the shoes of, of the person that had actually done it. So I can imagine that you couldn't use all the information in these diaries that you found. Um, were, was there anything you had to leave out for writing purposes that, that would be sort of really interesting for people? Did, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, whenever you write a book, there's only so much you can include, as you say. Um, and actually, since completing the book, I've, I've continued my research. I'm hoping to do potentially another project on along similar lines in the future, though I'm not entirely sure yet. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of information out there. Um, certainly, um, there's a lot of material related to the anti-Nazi cause that you were mentioning earlier. Um, I gathered a lot of that and just didn't have really room to include it, but there was a quite concerted effort to to shut these organizations down and to convince Americans to enter the war. And that's sort of a story that, that could certainly be told in the future. Um, and and there's, there's greater depth on some of this, too, as you say. Um, you know, these diaries are incredibly in-depth. There are many, many hundreds of pages. Um, there are certainly more stories there that I wasn't able to include. Because I can imagine it sounds like a lot of the what you came across you can't find online. It's not been digitized in any way. Yeah, I use a very small number of digitized sources. Um, the most, most digitized material that I used um, were actually digitized newspapers. And this is something that has really, I think, changed the, the profession of historical writing pretty dramatically, at least for those of us who work on 19th and 20th century material. But um, certainly having digitized and searchable newspaper databases was incredibly helpful. And that led me to really find some, some fairly obscure accounts of, of meetings that took place in far-flung parts of the country, of, um, in some cases, uh, sort of localized riots that actually uh, took place as a result of some of these things. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, writing writing this book 15 or 20 years ago would have been virtually impossible, certainly in the same way, because it wouldn't have been possible to find those things. But in terms of archives themselves, yeah, I primarily, primarily did on-the-ground research. Uh, one of the more useful uh, digitized resources I used was um, a library of material related to the Nuremberg trials. So mm-hmm. a lot of the Nuremberg evidence was um, or has been digitized and placed online, and obviously that's a voluminous amount of material, and some of that was helpful, but the vast majority of it was material that I actually viewed in person. Mm-hmm. Can you name uh, some of the top cities in the U.S. that where, where there was a concentration of Nazi support? Well, New York City is the most obvious, yeah. Um, New York City, of course, America's leading city then and now, largest city, large immigrant population, both then and now. Um, so that New York City was the headquarters of the German-American boon. It was the headquarters of, um, of that sort of effort. Chicago, interestingly, becomes the headquarters for America First. Um, America First stronghold is in the upper Midwest, and there's some interesting potential reasons why that might be the case. The Midwest has certainly had a, a long tradition of isolationist politics, and so that's where America First is based. Um, but interestingly, the Silver Legion is based on the West Coast, so their stronghold is around Seattle, 
in the Pacific Northwest, and they have uh, the largest number of supporters is there. Um, then the other one that, that interested me was Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a, a fairly small city in this period. It's actually surrounded by orchards and uh, farmland still at this point. But a huge number of German-American boon members there around the L.A. and Hollywood area, large number of Silver Legion members. And actually, um, the government was particularly concerned about Los Angeles because it was one of the few places where these far-right groups actually began to link up with one another successfully. And so there was fear that L.A. might become a, a hotbed of um, subversion in some ways because these organizations were actually cooperating. Now, obviously, the book is about Nazism, but uh, is there anything, any mentions of Italian fascism? Any connection? Yeah, no, there's... There, Certainly there are, yeah. Um, and, and I think there's there's another potential interesting project there. Um, but yeah, supporters of Italian fascism do get involved in the German-American boot, actually. There's sort of an Italian division of that organization. And so they are present as well. Um, much smaller numbers, though. I, I get the impression, certainly, although I did not dig into this particularly deep, that Italian-Americans were much less amenable to, to Mussolini's fascism than, than German-Americans who got involved with the boon. One explanation for that might be that Italian immigration came from a slightly different period. Um, that was sort of an earlier 19th century immigration wave, whereas a lot of Germans had moved to the U.S. again in the 1920s after World War I. Um, and America, one thing we should remember is that America actually has a racial quota system in this period. So it was actually easier for a German to move to the United States than an Italian in the 1920, late 1920s. Um, and so I get the impression that Italian fascist sympathizers were, were much lesser. There were, there were far fewer of them. Um, but that would be another interesting area of research, yeah. So just to touch on Los Angeles, and you mentioned this mystic already, but did you come across any small uh, movie studios or anyone trying to create pro-Nazi uh, films of any sort? Yeah, the movie studios are interesting. There's been a, lo a lot of work done on them recently by other historians, and for that reason I kind of stayed away from this. Um, you don't really see any examples of people producing pro-Nazi material, or at least examples that I could find, but certainly the Hollywood studios are playing a dangerous game of footsie with the Nazis in this period, if you will. They're very afraid of offending uh, Hitler's government, partially because they are afraid that the Germans will strip away their distribution rights and that obviously hurts their bottom line. Mm -hmm. And to that end, they end up um, trying really hard to not make anti-Nazi films until fairly late in the game. One of the first, if not the first, um, films criticizing the German government was called Confessions of a Nazi Spy. And it was actually released um, after a Nazi spy network had been broken up by the FBI. And there was a sensationalist best-selling book written about it by a former FBI agent who was involved in that. Mm -hmm. And this film was very clearly about the German-American the plot is sort of revolves around a um, an organization that is supposed to be the boon that wears uniforms and sort of gives C. Kyles a lot. Um, and within that organization, there is a secret Nazi spy net. So it's not a particularly good film. I have seen it. It's, uh, I'm not sure I would recommend watching it in its entirety. <laughs> but it was a groundbreaking film because it was the first film to really criticize uh, criticize the Nazis in that way. And Hitler's government actually filed an official protest with the U.S. State Department over it. German-American Boone considered suing the studio for libel. Um, and so it's just very sort of odd things. Mm -hmm. What part of the research was most enjoyable? <laughs> well, I enjoy research uh, overall, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And that's one of my favorite parts of my job is I get to research. Uh, but research can be arduous, certainly. Um, I, I think, you know, what was interesting about researching this project was the number of places that I went for it. Um, you know, traveling to Kansas, which I'd never been to actually prior to this writing this book, that was quite interesting. Uh, when you when you travel places, you sort of get a sense of what was what might have been going on on the ground there. You get a sense of how people are by meeting them and interacting with them. And so I think that was that was quite interesting. Um, I think the other interesting or enjoyable part of this was sort of looking at this stuff from the British perspective, being in the archives in London and Edinburgh, looking at them talking about the United States, which I've lived in for most of my life, obviously, though I've lived in the UK as well, um, and sort of looking at how, how they were perceiving these events. Because we tend to think of the American story in American terms. We think of it from our perspective and everyone else's perspective is sort of sort of forgotten about in that sense. So it was very interesting to read what the British were saying about U.S. politics, about organizations in the U.S., about President Roosevelt. Um, quite interesting to see that from sort of outside eyes. I guess the British would have been very um, sensitive about having one of their spies caught in the U.S. That that might have caused something of a diplomatic issue. 
Oh, no, they're absolutely terrified of it. Um, and there's an interesting fight. I talk about this in the introduction of the book. But there's a fight within uh, the FBI over what they should do about this. So the FBI obviously knows that the British are, are running these types of operations. Um, and they and J. Edgar Hoover quite resents it. He resents the fact that they're being allowed to operate on American soil. And so at various points, Hoover tries to convince Congress and convince Roosevelt that he should shut the stuff down, that he should arrest these British agents, and he should uh, basically shut down the... British uh, intelligence network in Washington and across the country, and Roosevelt just staunchly refuses to do it. Uh, I think one thing that did strike me in, in writing this, that Roosevelt has a very interesting vision, and he has an interesting perspective on this, and he essentially does allow the British to do stuff that he wouldn't have allowed any other power to do. And I think that's because he, he sort of realizes that the U.S. entry in the war is probably inevitable, and that allowing the British to do stuff that's kind of skirting the outer boundaries of the law, if not outright illegal, um, is not desirable necessarily, but it's probably necessary to assist in that, uh, preserving the national security of the United States. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned a few things that you were surprised to find in your research. Can you mention um, something else or maybe what was most surprising that maybe you haven't mentioned yet? Yeah, well, I mean, one thing that certainly surprised me looking at uh, political papers from this period uh, was the level of hatred towards Franklin Roosevelt. It's something that we almost have forgotten about today because we see Roosevelt as this revered, great American president who everyone, every historian ranks at the top five now. Um, and we forget that this, this guy was incredibly controversial, uh, not least because he runs for a third and a fourth term. Mm-hmm. And so one of the more interesting discoveries I made um, was sort of finding anti-Roosevelt propaganda, anti-Roosevelt liars, if you will, from the 1940 election, um, one of which actually has a... Um, I guess we call it a Photoshop version um, of FDR behind prison bars. So sort of a direct echo of mm. the lock her up chance of 2016 type thing. Mm. Um, but the level of anti-Roosevelt prejudice, level of anti-Roosevelt hatred was very high in this country. It was also bipartisan. That was another surprising thing. There were Democrats who turned violently against Roosevelt um, in the course of the 1940s. There wasn't much you could do about it because they were in the U.S. Senate and they kept getting reelected. And so um, Roosevelt was you know, sort of this great outsized figure certainly wins an unprecedented third and fourth term, but that did not mean he was universally loved by any stretch of the imagination. Mm-hmm. Um, a question I forgot to ask before, are there any um, authors, U.S. authors, that uh, we might be surprised to learn were supportive of Nazism, or any literature, you know, novels or such written in support of it? Um, not so much here. Um, there is some evidence that Ezra Pound, the poet, may have been a sort of sympathizer in this area. Um, certainly in, in Britain you do have some examples of that. There are uh, far-right authors who um, begin writing novels that are sort of echoing fascist themes. One example that comes to mind is Wyndham Lewis, mm-hmm. uh, who is both a painter and a novelist. Um, in the U.S., though, I think the, the literary establishment certainly is, is more left-leaning. And, and one great example of that is Sinclair Lewis. Mm-hmm. Uh, who writes a book called It Can't Happen Here. Um, Sinclair Lewis is actually married to Dorothy Thompson, who's a left-wing journalist in this period, who uh, uses her nationally syndicated column to expose and denounce a lot of these groups. So I think the, I think the U.S. literary scene is, is more left-leaning. Um, the British literary scene, I think, is more split, and certainly we do see some indication that there were, that there were fascist sympathizers um, who were fairly well-placed within the British literary establishment. What uh, what question or issue is the most difficult for you to research that maybe you even haven't come to a solid conclusion on, or maybe just took the most time? Well, I think the most difficult question, I think, is, is an unanswerable one, and that is why do people join these groups? Um, we don't have a lot of evidence, really, about how many people were in them or who those individuals were. There was deliberate destruction of records that took place. Um, the FBI and the Department of Justice have not opened the entirety of their investigative records from this period. And even if they did, they would be so voluminous that I'm not sure any historian could really uh, go through them all. We'd be talking potentially about hundreds of thousands of investigations that took place in this period. They were t- utterly strapped for resources because there was so much going on. So I think one of the key questions is, why do people join these groups? Um, and I, I don't think that's easily answerable, although we can make some generalizations. I think for the German-American boon, there is this affinity for either a combination of Nazism and, and German, Germany itself, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, in the case of the Silver Legion, I think we have people there that, that sort of see themselves as um, true Americans, quote-unquote, and think that foreigners are, are stealing their status 
doing their job, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the more troubling one, though, is, is America First. America First is an organization of 800,000 people nationwide. This is huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, why do people join this group? It's, it's incredibly complicated of a question to answer. Some of them certainly genuinely do want to just keep the U.S. out of a war and don't think that we should be fighting in Europe. Others of them have more sinister motives. Certainly we know that German-American wound members um, are also in that organization. So I think it's impossible for us to ever really answer this question, but I think um, one avenue of future research might be trying, as the records become available, looking at what motivated the average member to actually join and take part in these organizations. In reference to the documents you mentioned that are still um, classified or protected from public uh, viewing, as a historian, have you ever tried to, um, you know, get them made public or do a FOIA request or anything like that? Absolutely, yeah. I did FOIA request some documents for this book, um, and, and they were they were open. Um, certainly, I, I've gotten access to documents that no one has probably ever looked at since they were created because they were pretty much entirely declassified once they went through that process. The problem with FOIA, as I'm sure you and many of your listeners will know, is that it's a very lengthy process. So filing the request itself is quite easy, uh, but then you end up waiting two or three years for these documents. And so as somebody who's trying to publish a book and has publishing deadlines, at some point you just can't wait anymore for these things. And I guess there's also the issue of you don't you don't know what exists necessarily, so you wouldn't even know to ask for something. Well, right, and that's that's the other issue is that to make an effective FOIA request, you really do have to have the name of somebody, and you have to have their date of birth and ideally date of death. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can you can make more general requests than that, but the more general the request is, the longer it will take to fulfill. Because if you put in a request for everyone who was a member of the German American Boon. <laughs> you're talking thousands upon thousands of investigative files that would then have to be identified in the first place mm-hmm. and then declassified one by one. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some cases, my understanding, although I've never done this, was that they will uh, release partial files as they sort of declassify them or give you stuff as, as they go. Mm-hmm. But to declassify everything related to the German-American boon would, would be virtually impossible, I would think. Hmm. So considering the documents that you did end up getting access to, um, do you have a sense of why why these all is it just because it's time consuming that these all haven't been made public or you know what's the issue there that's keeping them under wraps yeah I, th- I think it's, it's it's time consuming I think it's also inevitably lack of resources I mean the FBI certainly has other things to do than look at 75 year old files and determine whether the historians can look at them or not mm-hmm. um, you know the files they did get open they released virtually I would say 99% of, of the documents. The only things that I could, that were redacted when I got them were actually the names of confidential informants, and there were some passages that were redacted that seemed to relate to the methods that had been used to to surveil these individuals. So um, what that implies, I'm not entirely sure, but but certainly I, I think it's just lack of resources. I don't think that there's anything in these documents that necessarily is just it really needs to be classified necessarily, except for some names for privacy reasons or because they were promised confidentiality. Um, and certainly it's understandable that, that any law enforcement organization does not want to reveal the methods that used even 75 years ago. So yeah. government classification is interesting, and it's sort of a um, an, an area that a lot of historians have frustrations with. I think what we have to understand as researchers is that the government has its own interest in these things. Um, there are reasons why they want to keep these, these names private. There are certainly reasons why they want to protect their methods, and that's, that's all in the interest of national security. So while this can be a very frustrating thing, it's, it's sort of the reality in that way. Mm-hmm. But it also leaves so much so much untapped potential for research still of, of all kinds. Oh, abso- ab- absolutely. And I think that's one, one thing that actually really appeals to me about the, the historical profession. And certainly I... I really enjoy working on 20th century history because there is always that question of when is the, when is the next tranche of material going to become available? What, what stories are trapped in those archives? Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling to sit back and imagine just how vast the FBI archives must be or how vast the, um, you know, national security archives must be at the National Archives these days. Mm-hmm. Um, and there must be so many incredible stories in there. And I think that's really what appeals to me as a historian is, is being able to as my actual job and actually get paid for this stuff, mm-hmm. um, tell stories that nobody's really heard before. Was there anything you came across that uh, particularly had had an emotional impact on you, either sad or something particularly funny or, or uplifting? <laughs> 
yeah, well, this is not a particularly uplifting or funny book, I have to admit. Um, I, I think one thing that, that really struck me was reading accounts of America First rallies. And this is an organization that's very easy to, to demonize, I think, um, from our perspective today and say, oh, these were a bunch of Nazi sympathizers. They were helping the Nazi cause, even if they didn't themselves know it. But one of the accounts um, that I was reading um, revolved around the appearance of a group of Gold Star Mothers at this rally. And the Gold Star Mothers, of course, are women who have lost uh, husbands or sons in the war, in this case, largely World War I. Um, and this account reproduced the incredibly emotional... Um, speech that one of these Gold Star Mothers gave, in which she said that her motivation for being there tonight was to ensure that there were no Gold Star Mothers ever again. Mm-hmm. So I think it's very difficult to not be emotionally touched by a sentiment like that, even expressed in a venue that we might find um, you know, distasteful and questionable. I, I think it's very difficult to not conclude that that person was genuine and, and there for what they believe were the right, right reasons that night. What kind of records were kept um, on meetings? Is it just basically newspaper articles, or did you find more as far as what they discussed and such and said? Yeah, certainly newspaper articles were an, an incredible resource because most of these groups, not so much the German American Bund or the um, Silver Legion, but certainly America First, these, these rallies were huge. They were covered in the newspapers quite extensively, um, and the America First leaders were heavily quoted. Um, so, yes, newspaper records were one. Um, there were also actually a surprising number of people infiltrating these meetings, as it turned out. So I mentioned um, the Chicago journalist who infiltrated the Boone. Um, he provided some interesting accounts of those meetings. But also in, in Los Angeles, there was a group called the Hollywood Anti-Nazi, which was run by um, a Hollywood set of actors and producers who feared expanding Nazi influence in the film industry and in the physical Hollywood area. And so they actually hired private investigators to infiltrate uh, Boone and Silver Legion meetings and actually also record all of the license plates of the vehicles outside. So those are really interesting accounts, um, and they actually filed them with the headquarters. They survived today in the UCLA archives, which they did visit. Uh, and those are quite interesting and in some cases humorous because you will have um, some of these private investigators making remarks like, this was the dumbest meeting I've ever been to, or this was so appalling I needed to have a drink afterwards, that kind of stuff. <laughs> So when you, when you mention um, actors and such being anti-Nazi, it sort of uh, makes me think of a thread of, I wonder how many were also members of the Communist Party and maybe ended up getting persecuted during the Mac- McCarthy era later. That's absolutely true. And actually, the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League was effectively a communist front. Uh, the money for it had been put up by a communist agent in Hollywood. And so this becomes a problem for them because the, the League at one point tries to go public and spread spread around its evidence as to what uh, is taking place with the moon. And the, and the evidence appears quite strong. It's quite striking. They infiltrate these organizations. And the immediate response to that is that they find themselves under investigation for being a communist front. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, one of the people who writes or send the cable to the um, to Congressman Martin Dyes, who is the chairman of what will later become the Who Act Committee. One of the people who denounces them is the head uh, head guy in the local German American boot. <laughs> These guys are unequivocally communist, and we've infiltrated them too. So it's quite an interesting sort of back and forth there. And you're absolutely right. Some of these people who are involved in this do face persecution later. Um, again, accurately or inaccurately, for having been involved with what is perceived, at least, as a communist organization. It's kind of fascinating because World War I also had a lot of, I guess, citizens were legally allowed to spy on their fellow citizen, you know, and it sounds like, you know, during up to World War II, you know, the run up to it, you know, Americans, again, were all spying against each other. Not all, but, you know, a fair amount. Yeah, and, and we should remember these are also public meetings to some extent, right? I mean, there's there's no law against going to a public meeting and writing a report about what's going on there. Um, mm-hmm. It gets a little more questionable when you're doing things like going to a German-American boon meeting and maybe lying to get in there or actually joining the organization under false pretenses or something. But, um, yeah, there, there are no laws against this. And, and that, you're, you're absolutely right. This is something that is very striking about this period is the level of Concern and in some ways paranoia about this leads Americans to do things that certainly the average citizen wouldn't think to do otherwise, spying on their neighbors, infiltrating local political meetings, uh, hiring private investigators to, to tail their neighbors. Um, this is all pretty strange behavior, but it is a precursor to what we see in the 1950s. 
certainly the 1950s McCarthy era, we see similar things, not so much necessarily on the part of average citizens, although there is an element of that with groups like the John Birch Society, who sort of become almost vigilantes against communism in some ways, um, but certainly on the part of the U.S. government as well. And I think one, one of the reasons why, and I sort of allude to this in the conclusion of the book, one of the reasons why the McCarthy era is so so vicious and virulent in that way is because people are, are deeply concerned about what had happened in the 1930s. Even though fascism is a defeated ideology at that point, I think there is a feeling among uh, people in the national security establishment and also just average Americans that this kind of thing can never be allowed to happen again. Mm-hmm. And so some of the reason, I think, for the excesses of that era is because people remember this period, remember that, that probably this too much was allowed to go on, and don't want that to be repeated. Hmm. Interesting. So what do you hope the book will do? Well, I hope it'll sell some copies, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, no, I, I, I hope that the book um, opens people's eyes to a period that we, I think, have, have some really bad misconceptions about. I think this is history that, that needs to be in the textbooks, certainly more than it is. You know, I, I used to teach American history um, at, the, at the college level. I don't remember this stuff even being in the textbook that I was teaching from really at all. Mm-hmm. If it was even even there, it was on a side, maybe a sidebar, maybe even just a sentence or two. Mm-hmm. But I think we need to understand the moral, the moral and political ambiguities of this period. And I think that's really important because as a country, we, we want to tell ourselves a certain mythology about the 1930s, 1940s. We want to talk about the Great Depression and the suffering that Americans went through. And then we want to talk about World War II and the heroism associated with that, and, and very much rightly so. But we also need to remember that that was not unanimous opinion. There were a lot of people in this country that um, that were political extremists, became extremists because of the Depression, so it wasn't all um, this sort of rosy, well, I wouldn't say rosy, but this sort of story that we tell ourselves about um, suffering and everyone turning to FDR for reassurance type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we need to understand as well that American entry into World War II was by no means inevitable. Mm-hmm. And I think we've sort of, as the World War II generation and the memory of this stuff has sort of passed away, um, I think we are sort of coming around to the view that, oh, it was just a matter of time before we got into the war and the Japanese pushed us over with the Pearl Harbor attack. Mm-hmm. Certainly the Pearl Harbor attack ended that debate, but the isolationist interventionist debate was a very hard fought. And if Pearl Harbor hadn't happened in December of 1941, I'm actually not sure whether we would have gone into the war. Mm-hmm. Um, it might have been a World War One type situation where we got into the war right at the end. Um, and that's a very troubling thought in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, or if the U.S. had entered the war earlier, um, you know, perhaps it would have ended differently. You know, things may have been much different. So, Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's not so much whether the U.S. entered the war earlier. I'm not sure that we ever would have gotten it in September of 1939, for instance. But I think mm-hmm. what, what Hitler's American friends did accomplish was preventing Roosevelt from taking a very strong line with with the Axis powers. So if in 1939, Roosevelt has issued a statement saying, if you do not withdraw from Poland within 24 hours, Hitler, the United States will enter the war on the side of the British, that would have made a big impact. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly, he wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to bluff that one. They certainly would have had to be able to back that with actions, potentially. But this is the one thing that's very clear that Hitler fears the most. Hitler remembers the lesson of World War One, and that lesson is, don't get the U.S. into the war on the side of your, of your opponent. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's really what they accomplished, is they prevent Roosevelt from any kind of a public statement like that. They sort of tie American foreign policy into not. And the result of that is that Hitler gets not not a free hand in Europe, but he doesn't have to worry about American intervention until after 19, late 1941. That, I think that has a very applicable lesson uh, for today, too, uh, with some of the issues Absolutely. going on. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, all this talk about red lines in foreign policy and should, what should the U.S. do um, in regards to situations like the Syrian civil war. Um, one thing we have to remember, and I think it's easy for Americans to forget this, is the word of the United States carries a great deal of weight on the world stage. Certainly it did in 1939, and certainly it does today. Mm-hmm. Can you speak to any difficulties you had in getting the book finished um, and published and how you overcame those? You know, I had a really great, I have a really great publishing team, um, St. Martin's Press, Thomas Dunn Books, which is the imprint. Um, they've done a tremendous job, um, really professional, really great team, um, from start to finish. And so no, no real problems, um, in the publishing process. I think every, every author, um, you know, hits, hits moments of despair, frankly. <laughs> um, there's always that moment where you're sitting there staring at, at the chapter you have and wondering whether it's good enough, wondering whether, what people are going to think of it. Um, but you know, this, this book actually, um, went fairly smoothly for me. I've written other books in the past. 
Um, and I, I think, you know, maybe it's just because I've, I've done this before type thing, but I thought this process actually went very well. And I can't say enough about how, how great the team has been with this on the publishing side. Okay. Um, you mentioned a few uh, possible future projects. Do you have any concrete writing project that you're working on now or... Nothing right now. I think, I think as we were saying earlier, there are more stories to tell from this era. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there's, there's a lot more to explore in terms of the politics of, of this period, um, the sort of isolationist, interventionist debate. And I think as we were saying a moment ago, there are stories here that need to be told. Uh, there are stories of individuals that, that committed incredible acts of heroism. People like this reporter who infiltrated the moon. There are people who um, committed acts that were that are quite dubious in terms of their legality and their and their, even their their loyalty to the United States. I think there's an entire sort of host of, of stories to be told. I think this is the right time to tell them. Um, as we were saying a moment ago, the World War II generation is very sadly passing away, um, and I think it's it's important and and the moment is really opening up to start telling the stories of what happened in, in this really important time in American history. So where can people find the book, and do you have a website or social media presence where people can follow your um, writing? Absolutely. The book is available through Amazon and all other fine retailers. Um, I highly recommend supporting local bookshops. I love local bookshops, and I'm sure any of them will be happy to order it. The book comes out October 2nd, so um, just a few days from when we're speaking now. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I'm available on all forms of social media. Uh, my Twitter handle is Dr. Dr. B. Hart. Dr. V. Hart, um, and so I encourage your listeners to follow me. I also have a website, which is bradleywhart.com, um, and I should mention the book is available on Kindle, it's available in hardback, it's also going to be available in audiobook format, so mm-hmm. for listeners who, uh, who enjoy listening to your podcast and maybe want to listen to the um, book in a similar format, uh, we got a fantastic guy to do the do the reading on, and I think they'll really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Good. Uh, any? Uh, that, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? No, I, I want to thank you for the time. Um, I hope your listeners will go out and check out the book. I, I really do think this is an important and, and in some ways timely story, and I hope that it provokes uh, a really important discussion. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you. This podcast has been presented by War Scholar. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com for more great interviews and military history information. Your visits help support this podcast. One of the best ways to provide feedback for this podcast is to rate me on iTunes. Please give me a good rating if you liked it, or feel free to give me a bad rating if you didn't. I'll use that feedback to make this a better podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram under Chris Alvarez War Scholar. That's Chris without an H, C R I S. On Facebook under War Scholar on YouTube under War Scholar 1945, and on Twitter under War Scholar. Thank you, and I hope you return to this podcast for more great military history.